applied ego. Heidegger's thinking in being and time explained with Simon Critchley. Episode three. In this episode, um, I want to mainly talk about space and what Heidegger says about space because the book is called Being and Time. But what is the relationship between being and space? But the, um, the chapter which we're looking at here, which is chapter three of um, Being and Time, division one, is in three parts. And in episode two, I went through the, the first part, part A, paragraphs 14 to 18. And uh, I want to focus on the third part, which is on space. But the second part, just a few words about that, because it's um, interesting that I don't want to go through it in, uh, in great detail. It's a discussion of Descartes, René Descartes. And um, the point of the discussion of Descartes is to provide a, a negative confirmation of Heidegger's ontology of the world. Namely, to show uh, a picture of the world, a picture of the world that we can find in Descartes and in people that come after Descartes, notably Kant for Heidegger. How a picture of the world uh, is formed, um, a picture of the world which Heidegger believes is impoverished, mistaken, um, and a picture of the world that needs to be deconstructed or destroyed in order for the Heideggerian picture of the world to, to get a grip. So, very crudely, um, we could ask ourselves, you know, well, how does Descartes think about world? Well, he thinks about world in relationship to one concept, and that concept is extension. That the world is a thing, a set of things, uh, a totality of things which are extended. And um, so, as you might know if you've had an even you know, cursory sense of what uh, Descartes is up to in his work, there are two kinds of things in, um, there are two kinds of things. There are extended things, uh, things in the world, natural things, things which are made, uh, and then there are things like us, and we are thinking things. So extended things and thinking things. And the question that Heidegger is looking at is really how that uh, idea of the world as extension, as extended things, really what, what happens with that. And the, the, um, the point that he's making in these paragraphs, this is paragraphs 19, 20, 21, is that Descartes' ontology of the world, kind of in quotation marks, as extension, does not seek the phenomenon of the world at all. It passes over, it leaps over the phenomenon and interprets world in terms of the ontology of the present at hand. So, the claim he makes in his discussion of Descartes is that the being of things in Descartes, the being of entities, is determined as constant presence at hand. Something constantly present. Um, something constantly present as something available to knowledge um, and the knowledge based upon intuition or perception. So our relationship to the world is an intuitive, perceptive relationship to the world. And as you might know, Descartes is suspicious of the evidence of sensation and perception. He um, moves back from that 
uh, towards a more abstract idea of extension, which can be determined geometrically or mathematically. Um, that's a separate topic, but the thought here is that the being of the world for Descartes is apprehended as constantly present at hand. And if you begin from that idea of constant presence at hand, then you miss the phenomenon of the world. And um, it's that conception, that Cartesian picture of the world that Heidegger thinks has to be um, destroyed, deconstructed. In seeing the world as constant presence at hand, Descartes does not see the world. The world is overlooked. It becomes invisible. And furthermore, um, this passing over of the phenomenon of the world in Descartes is not accidental. It's not a simple mistake that can be rectified. Rather, there is what we might call a tendency to falling into the tradition that happens in Descartes. Um, one of the things that Heidegger would do in these paragraphs is he'll show how Descartes' idea of extension, of uh, the world as being composed of extended things, draws from a medieval understanding of substance, and that draws, that goes all the way back to the Greek idea uh, we find in Aristotle of substance as uh, ousia, substance or essence, which defines the nature of things for Aristotle. The point that Heidegger's making is that Descartes just takes over uh, a determination of being from the tradition without examining its meaning. And that taking over from the tradition is part of a tendency towards falling, falling into tradition that for Heidegger defines the modern world picture or what philosophers, unlike me, would call modernity. People love to talk about modernity. I don't like to talk about modernity so much. But the, the idea is that there's a modern world picture, a Cartesian world picture, the world as composed of um, uh, objective stuff which can be is best in understood scientifically and the paradigm for um, <clears throat> science in the modern worldview is mathematics. So what we have in the Cartesian picture of the world is the mathematization of nature, the mathematization of nature. And again, it's not that Heidegger thinks that conception is wrong. It's just working with a set of assumptions that need to be um, need to be examined. We have to deconstruct the Cartesian picture of the world in order to see that which shows itself as world, a practical world, a handy world, a world that we live in and find meaningful, but a world, that world that we live in that's become invisible. Now, this raises a really um, interesting question I'll just mention here and we'll come back to in uh, later episodes, I imagine. It's that uh, what Heidegger is doing in Being in Time is phenomenology. Phenomenology understood simply as a description of um, existence and then the attempt to deduce certain structures from the description of existence, what he calls the existentials. And he characterizes those existentials as a priori. Um, so that's good. That's a constructive phenomenology. But that phenomenology has to be linked uh, for Heidegger to a destruction or a deconstruction of the tradition. And indeed, in the introduction to Being in Time, um, he says that the, um, the question of the meaning of being, as he understands it, will only become concrete, it's the word he uses, concrete, once we have proceeded through a complete destruction 
or deconstruction of the ontological tradition. And that ontological tradition is one that, uh, in the modern period, finds its shape in the work of Descartes. So this has an interesting um, consequence, uh, maybe two consequences that I could uh, draw out here. Firstly, that what Heidegger is doing in Being in Time is a formal analysis of the world, a formal phenomenology of the world, in order for that to become concrete, to become actual in the world, we require a deconstruction of the world picture that dominates um, uh, our thinking about the world, which we find in Descartes. And uh, secondly, that what Heidegger is doing is close to a kind of ideology critique. Heidegger is trying to dismantle the ideology of the modern world picture that he find that he thinks finds its real uh, shape and force in the work of Descartes and that Cartesian picture is then refined but inherited and reproduced in the work of Immanuel Kant but let's leave that to one side for a second and move on to the question of space we're still in chapter three part c and Heidegger's going to analyze the question of space. Um, and the first move he's, that we should make is that the word for space and spatiality in German are the words Raum and Räumlichkeit, um, which are linked as the terms uh, is evident from the way they sound to the ideas of room and roomliness and in many ways Heidegger's point in um, these very interesting paragraphs of being in time is to understand the idea of space in terms of room and spatiality in terms of roomliness namely that space um, is experienced by me right now as the room that I'm in and the roomliness of this room the fact that it feels uh, of a nice temperature it feels temperate um, I am I'm aware of space firstly as being inside a room and the the point to make in relationship to that is that Dasein's insideness the insideness of Dasein is not the insideness of consciousness or the mind which is somehow in the head but rather it is um, a sense of being in a room spatially spread out in the um, the meaningfulness of a room that we inhabit now there's a vast and hugely important question about the relationship between time to space in Heidegger's work and the relation of both these uh, concepts to being. In the early work of Heidegger, it's fair to say that there is a subordination of space to time. And indeed, this is suggested by the title of the book that we're reading, Being and Time. The book is not called Being and Space. And being is time, and time is finite, as I said in the first episode. Now, the first thing to note is the terms that we use to describe um, Dasein. Um, terms like openness, which I've said a few times, ecstasis, uh, transcendence, disclosure. Um, these are all spatial terms, spatial metaphors. If Dasein is a transcendent being, if its being is to be in the world, if it's always already out there in the world, and that's temporal being, then the way I'm understanding that is spatially, in terms of spatial metaphors. There's a bigger question here about whether time can be understood temporally, or whether time always has to be understood in terms of spatial metaphors. Um, beginning of being in time, Heidegger says, time is the horizon for the understanding of the meaning of being. 
And again, horizon is a spatial term, something that I see on the horizon, as it were. So time uh, is more important than space in the early work. In Heidegger's later work, there is a move to what he calls time space, Zeitraum, which has a kind of unitary structure in Heidegger's later work. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. But this is a really interesting few pages, few paragraphs. And the question of space is analyzed in three moments. Let me just mention the key concepts and then I'll try and demonstrate them. Um, firstly, in paragraph 22, the question is, what is the spatiality of inner worldly ready to hand things? Again, this ugly Baroque Heidegger talk. What is the space of ready to hand handy stuff? And he says there are three terms there. The firstly is, first term is nearness or near. The second is place. And the third is region. And by region, again, it's one of these terms that the, the German term is Gegend which can be translated as region, but it means something closer to an idea like neighborhood, uh, uh, a kind of neighborhood or a vicinity, something like that. Near, place, region or neighborhood. In paragraph 22, sorry, paragraph 23, he talks about the spatiality of being in the world the spatiality of us, of Dasein. What do we do with space? And he has uh, introduces two concepts here, which, uh, which I'll explain. The firstly, the first concept is that our relation to space is one of what he calls de-severance or de-distancing. Again, he's working with a German term, which just means distance, entfernung, and he's breaking that term up um, in a particular way, it is um, the prefix is a, is a negation, ent, and fernung means, if you like, firing, so that the idea of ent fernung is an idea of kind of de firing. What does that even mean? It means that Dasein, us, our relationship to space is one where we bring things into the near, we bring things close. And we bring things close, the second concept in this paragraph, with direction. So it's the linking between bringing things close and direction. And I'll say some more about that. The, um, the third uh, paragraph that discusses space is paragraph 24. And what he's concerned with there is the genesis of the three-dimensional objective understanding of space. The understanding of space that we associate, say, with um, science uh, after Newton. Um, the Newtonian picture of the space, let's say. And how does that three-dimensional objective understanding of space get, um, to get formed? Um, and he, um, his claim there is going to be that that objective idea of space arises as a de-worlding as a, an increasing impoverishment in our lived existential understanding of space, which is what gives rise to the modern worldview. And, um, you know, there is, um, in Heidegger's later work, there is a preoccupation with space, which I'll just mention here. Um, there's a late text by Heidegger, which I think is available on audio uh, for those of you who really are insomniacs out there in audio land called Art and Space from 1969. And um, in this very short text, uh, he talks about um, uh, an idea of space as what he calls clearing away. He sets this up by uh, criticizing the conception of space that we find in early modern science in Galileo and then in Newton, space as a homogeneous expanse of possible places, uh, objective cosmic space. And he says that we should try and think about space more as a kind of clearing away. So I'll read a few words from 
this late text. This is Heidegger much, much, much later, 42, three, four years after being in time. He says, clearing away, clearing away. The German there is Räumen, is uttered therein. This means to clear out, to free from wilderness. Clearing away brings forth the free, the openness for man settling and dwelling. When thought in its own special character, clearing away is the release of places towards which the fate of dwelling man turns in the preserve of the home, or in the brokenness of homelessness, or the complete indifference to the two. Clearing away is the release of the places at which a god appears, the places from which the gods have disappeared, the places at which the appearance of the godly tarries along. In each case, the clearing away brings forth locality preparing for dwelling. Secular spaces are always the privation of often very remote sacred places. Space here existentially is thought of as a kind of clearing away, clearing a space, clearing a space for a clearing. And this shouldn't be confused with uh, Marie Kondo or anything like that. It's not clearing things up. It's an idea of clearing away as being linked to locality and dwelling and linking of those terms to the idea of the sacred, which is always linked for Heidegger to the idea of the sacrum, uh, sacred space. And as the sacred space, the area in and around a temple, a consecrated space. The sacred, and appeals to the sacred, are always appeals to uh, a locality, to a space, a site, a privileged space, the temple. The temple is a very good example of somewhere where the temple, tempus, time and space are unified. And that's later, Heidegger, much later. Let's go back to being in time. So paragraph 22, and I think this stuff is brilliant. He's talking about the spatiality of the register hand. And the spatiality of the register hand is what he calls closeness, the near. And the near is linked to place, platz, which is the wear of equipment, of stuff. Equipment always has its place. It's always somewhere. The hammer is in the hammer drawer or next, whatever. You get the idea. The near is linked to place and equipment, ready to hand equipment, it always has a place. And this idea of Closeness and place is linked to the idea of region, right? the idea of a neighborhood, that there is a whereabouts of stuff. And this idea of neighborhood is, um, is very interesting. How do, we, how do we negotiate space in an everyday average way? Well, we negotiate space, Heidegger was saying, in terms of the uh, words like the above, the below, the behind, not in terms of uh, an abstract, objective, three-dimensional idea of space, but in terms of how things show up. Um, and he talks in this, uh, this paragraph, um, so space is space round about us. That's a key thing, space round about us. And he gives the example here of the sun. And he says the sun is characterized by certain places. The sun is not objectively present at hand uh, insofar as it's experienced in terms of our environment, but the sun is experienced in terms of its places in relationship to our environment. Sunrise, midday, sunset, midnight. This is why, if you like, the um, geocentric view of the universe with the Earth at the center is intuitively right. right. It doesn't feel to us, proximally and for the most part, 
that the Earth is rotating around the Sun in some obscure corner of a vast galaxy of many millions of other galaxies in this ever-expanding cosmos. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like we're at the center of things and things, natural things show up in relationship to where we are. It feels like the sun rises and sets. And it's that uh, everyday intuitive understanding of space that uh, Heidegger wants to focus on here. He also talks about the way um, uh, space is organized um, in, say, houses. He'll talk about the house has its sunny side and its shady side, the way it's divided up into rooms, right? Be certain rooms which would be sunny rooms and certain rooms where the sun doesn't shine at certain points. And we'll organize our lives, we'll organize our lives spatially around certain rooms. He talks in these uh, pages about churches and graves, and churches and graves, certainly in Western Europe, uh, point towards the east, right? They point towards Jerusalem. They're organized in accordance with uh, a spatial organization which um, is linked to an idea of, of Christianity, largely. Now, the, um, the point he's making in paragraph 22 is that we do not perceive space uh, abstractly. We do not apprehend space abstractly. We inhabit places. Uh, we inhabit whereabouts. And the things that we have around us also inhabit those whereabouts. And things only show up as present at hand once they're no longer in their place, right? So, for example, if I say to myself, you know, where is my phone or where is my wallet? Uh, the wallet should be in my jean pocket or the phone should be in my bag or whatever. It's not there. And at that point, there'll be a switch from the register hand to the present at hand. A kind of categorical shift will take place at that moment. But first and foremost, proximally and for the most part, most closely and mostly, I experience the world as a world of a world that's around me. And this takes us on to paragraph 23. The condition of possibility, this language that Heidegger uses, this Kantian language of transcendental arguments, which are scattered across these pages of being in time. The condition of possibility for the spatiality of the register hand is us, is Dasein. So in the same way that Dasein is the worldhood of the world, spatially, um, we are the condition of possibility for this understanding of roomliness, space. So how is that idea of space? The spatiality of being in the world is, as I said a few minutes ago, de-faring or de-severance or de-distancing. And this de-distancing is a relation to space that makes farness disappear. Our relation to space is one where we bring it close. There's an extraordinary um, three-word sentence in um, this paragraph which makes no sense in English. In German, it's Entfernung, Entdeckt, Entfernheit. Which is like defaring, discovers, distance. That's translated as deseverance de de discovers remoteness, which says absolutely nothing. But the point he's making is really simple, is that the way in which we discover space is by reducing distance. And um, Dasein is characterized, Heidegger says, by a tendency towards the near, a tendency towards the near. And this is how Interestingly, continuing on with the um, anachronistic metaphors in Being and Time, here we have some wonderfully anachronistic technological metaphors in Being and Time. We get a discussion of radio. Um, he says on page 140 of the translation, all the ways in which we speed things up, we're more or less compelled to do today. All the ways, I repeat that quotation, 
all the ways in which we speed things up, as we are more or less compelled to do today, push us on towards the conquest of remoteness. With the radio, in quotation marks, for example, Dasein has so expanded its everyday environment that it has accomplished a deseverance of the world. So, let's take the example of radio. When I turn on the radio, I listen to the radio a lot. When I turn on the radio, that radio could have its source in New York or Washington DC or London or Paris or, you know, wherever. Um, but when I turn on that radio, I pull it into closeness. I'm in a relationship of complete intimacy, proximity to the radio program. And this is kind of how it is with, uh, with media for Heidegger. Uh, Heidegger didn't have the good fortune or he had, the, he had the, uh, the bad fortune or good fortune, depending on which way to see it. He didn't live in a time, um, certainly in being in time, where there were televisions around. But television in German is, a uh, television is a Fernseher, a far seer. But this kind of makes Heidegger's point. Uh, the television allows us to see far, but in seeing far, the far is drawn in close. So uh, media are a collapsing of distance for Heidegger. And obviously we could, um, we could develop that thought in a way that would be pretty alarming to Heidegger in relationship to social media. If the uh, intimacy of radio is one thing, the intimacy of television and the broadcast media is another thing, then think about the intimacy of our relationship to uh, social media, to our Instagram feed and our Facebook activity. That's a different kind of intimacy. There's a great uh, example uh, on page 141 of Being in Time where he talks about um, spectacles and telephone receivers and streets. And I wanna read this, just a few words of this. When, for instance, a man wears a pair of spectacles which are so close to him distantially that they are sitting on his nose, they are environmentally more remote from him than the picture on the opposite wall, right? So the spectacles through which I'm looking at the notes and looking at the room that I'm, I'm in and I'm, you know, I'm seeing the microphone, all the rest, is further away from me than the microphone, further away from the, the book I'm holding in my hand. That there's this kind of malleability of space, this shifting between the close and the far. So, um, you know, uh, the telephone rings and I'm pulled into proximity with someone who is far away. And if I'm on the street, say the telephone rings when I'm on the street, it's the street that's actually under my feet, the street that I'm moving along, the street that slides by my body, as Heidegger says. But then when the phone rings, I'm pulled out of that into a telephone conversation. The point being that Dasein brings things close, reduces distance. And Dasein's fundamental relationship to space is one of estimation. We do not measure things objectively. We do not measure things um, scientifically. We measure things in terms of estimation. And um, there's a lovely little discussion of this. So if we, if Dasein's relation to space is one of bringing things close, then that closeness is measured in terms of how we estimate that closeness. And this could bring us into a wider discussion of, uh, of measurement, which I won't go into now. Well, maybe I will. Let me just say this. This isn't something I believe, but let me just say it. Um, there's an argument for um, um, measurements in England, which is where I'm from, although I take no pride in the fact. There's an argument for measurement which is the, uh, an English, how long is an inch? An inch is an Englishman's thumb. A foot is an Englishman's foot. 
A yard is an Englishman's stride, right? So the measurement is estimation based upon the dimensions, in this case, of an Englishman. And this is then opposed to a, an objective understanding of measurement, which you can find, say, in Europe, which for some English people is kind of over there, a long way away. And there in Paris, in a bank or in the vaults of a, a government ministry, I forget where, they have the Mesa rule, the shining gold Mesa rule in a glass case sitting there as the objective, absolute measurement of space, the metrical system. Heidegger's point would be that actually we begin measuring by estimation. And the idea of an absolute measure or an objective measure is secondary to that. And that's the key thing that needs to be uh, remembered. The second um, element of this, this paragraph linked to the idea of bringing close is the idea of direction. That uh, it's not just that we bring things close, we bring things close by directing ourselves towards them. So. If the phone rings, um, I then direct myself towards the phone and bring the phone in close and speak to the person on the phone. So there is a question of um, spatial orientation here. And one thing that Heidegger is thinking about in these pages is, uh, is as often in Being in Time, is Kant and the problem of orientation in thinking. And how do we orientate between left and right, say. And Kant thought that left and right had to be understood in terms of the relationship to the body. Um, Heidegger's point is that that problem of orientation has to be understood as presupposing the directedness of being in the world. We have to engage in a phenomenology of uh, direction and bringing things close in order to understand the problem of orientation. And this brings us on to um, paragraph 24, which is uh, where Heidegger argues for the priority of existential spatiality, roomliness, um, the roundaboutness of space, and the derived or founded nature of scientific spatiality. And Heidegger, as often in, as the book Being in Time proceeds, um, comes up with really beautiful summaries of his, uh, his argument, and they're really worth reading. So, for example, on page 145, he says, um, as being in the world, Dasein is already discovered a world at any time. This discovery, which is founded upon the world of the world, is one that we have characterized as freeing entities for a totality of involvements. Freeing something and letting it be involved is accomplished by way of referring or assigning oneself circumspectively. And this in turn is based upon one's previously understanding significance. What's new in that language is the language of, of freeing. So our relationship to world, our relationship to space is one where we, 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 we clear away and we free up. And that's what has to be um, emphasized. So the question now becomes, well, how does this three-dimensionality of pure space, how does this Newtonian or Galileo view of Galilean view of space arise out of existential spatiality. And it arises, as um, will not be surprising by now, it arises by a relation of derivation. The, uh, the cognitive understanding of space, the scientific understanding of space, the idea of space as what, uh, what Kant calls the form of outer sense for the subject, um, are derived from this existential understanding of space, which is what comes first. And this is what we have to focus on. And interestingly, in these, 
these moments in being in time, these pages of being in time. There are references to uh, building, surveying, and calculation. And this takes us back to what I was saying about maybe about the temple and uh, the sacred. That we, let me put it this way, why do architects love Heidegger so much? Well, architects love Heidegger because he talks about building and dwelling and thinking, and he kind of dignifies their, their practice with a, a philosophical jargon, we might say, to be slightly cynical. But it's more that the, um, if we're to understand you know, what a building is, what it is to construct a, a place, that has to be understood in relationship to our being in the world, and not in relationship to some abstract uh, idea of spatiality. Because that abstract idea of spatiality um, will not produce dwelling. It will actually accentuate the homelessness of uh, modern experience. So, we could imagine in this relationship to space, um, the possibility of a, a Heideggerian architecture, which would be based upon our lived experience of the environment, of the space as it is around us. And it's not that we, um, it's not that we have to reject the um, objective scientific understanding of space, but we have to understand it, that the genesis of that conception of space out of being in the world. And in relationship to that, to finish like I finished last time, I want to finish this time with another poem, which I think perhaps makes Heidegger's point. Um, there are two poems, actually, which I've got uh, in front of me, and they're both by the Portuguese poet uh, Fernando Pessoa. Pessoa, who was the least known and uh, in many ways perhaps the most important, the greatest of the modernists, um, you know, his work was left in a trunk in Lisbon and only 30 or 40% of it has been published to this day. And he wrote in different personas, what he called heteronyms, uh, completely distinct personages with separate biographies and separate lives with different names. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the characters in this, in this universe of heteronyms was Fernando Pessoa himself, and there are others like Alvaro de Campos, um, Reis, and others. But the master, um, the master heteronym was someone called Alberto Cairo. And Alberto Cairo was described by Pessoa as a, sh a shepherd, a poet shepherd living on a hill. And uh, he writes poetry of enormous simplicity and some humor. And I think this maybe makes the point that Heidegger wants to make. So this is a poem by Pessoa in the voice of Alberto Cairo. What we see of things are the things. Why would we see one thing when another thing is there? Why would seeing and hearing be to delude ourselves when seeing and hearing are seeing and hearing? What matters is to know how to see to know how to see without thinking, to know how to see when seeing, and not think when seeing, nor see when thinking. But this requires deep study, lessons in unlearning, and a retreat into the freedom of that convent where the stars, say poets, are the eternal nuns and the flowers, the contrite believers of just one day, and where after all, the stars are just stars, and the flowers just flowers, which is why we call them stars and flowers. That's the poem. The thought here is that we have to learn to see things as things, and to see things as things in the space in which they appear, and not to delude ourselves by believing that seeing and hearing and seeing and hearing something else. 
we have to learn to see without thinking and not um, think when we should be seeing. And that sounds uh, simple, deceptively simple, but Pessoa goes on, or Alberto Caedo goes on, this requires deep study, lessons in unlearning. And in many ways, what Heidegger is trying to do in Being in Time is to give us lessons in unlearning. Unlearning the way in which natural science um, has explained the world, the Cartesian world picture has got a grip on us, unlearning that and relearning how to see the world as it is, uh, how we see things as things. So this is kind of the, if you like, the riddle of Heidegger. On the one hand, what he's saying is incredibly simple. He's trying to describe the absolutely obvious, but the absolutely obvious and incredibly simple has been blocked from our view by the world picture, the worldview that we've come to inhabit in the modern era. And that's what has to be destroyed in order to allow us to see things as things. And as I'm in the mood, and you're still there, I'm going to read you another poem by Cairo, uh, which makes the same point in a different and maybe even better way. This is poem number five by Cairo. To not think of anything is metaphysics enough. What do I think of the world? Who knows what I think of it? If I weren't well, then I'd think about it. What's my idea about matter? What's my opinion about causes and effects? What are my thoughts on God and the soul and the creation of the world? I don't know. To think about such things would be to shut my eyes and not think. It would be to close the curtains of my window, which, however, has no curtains. The mystery of things? What mystery? The only mystery is that some people think about mystery. If you're in the sun and close your eyes, you begin to not to know what the sun is, and you think about various warm things. But open your eyes and you see the sun, and you can no longer think about anything because the light of the sun is truer than the thoughts of all philosophers and all poets. The light of the sun doesn't know what it does, and so it cannot err, and it's common and good. Metaphysics? What metaphysics do those trees have? Only that being green and lush, and of having branches which bear fruit in their season, and we think nothing of it. We hardly even notice them. But what better metaphysics than theirs, which consists in not knowing why they live and in not knowing that they don't know? That's that poem. Fascinating, right? Mystery of things, what mystery? If we delude ourselves with mystery and we ask ourselves these huge questions, what do I think about matter? What is cause? What's effect? Who is God? Is there a God? What is the soul? Is there a soul? Did, was the world created or did it, has it always existed? Blah, 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 blah. To think about these things would be to shut one's eyes to the world. It would be to shut the curtains of existence and to uh, live in this kind of um, abstract, fake world. Um, as the poet says here, you know, the important thing is not to think about mystery. If you're in the sun, you close your eyes, um, then you can begin to think about it. But the point is not to close your eyes and to be in the sun. And the light of that sun is truer than the thoughts of all philosophers and all poets. So, in many ways, what Alberto Cairo Pessoa is doing is similar to what Heidegger is arguing for in uh, his discussion of space and the wider arguments of being in time. We have to go back to seeing things as things, seeing the absolutely obvious as obvious, and to stop asking certain questions. As the poet says here, what do I think of the world? Who knows what I think of it? If I weren't well, then I'd think about it. 
the condition that makes possible certain kinds of philosophical questions is sickness. It's a disease, as Wittgenstein says in the investigations. And we have to learn to get well, to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle, to go back to everyday life insofar as we can. And that's what Heidegger, that simple lesson, is what Heidegger's uh, trying to encourage us to do in his work. But, and this is going to take us to the next episode, that world and the spatiality of that world, the roominess of that world, is not just a world of things, a world of hammers and radios and so on and so forth. It's also a world of persons. So the next theme we're going to look at is the question of being with others. Uh, how do we understand that? in relationship to the understanding of world. But we'll pick that up next time. Thank you very much. See you next time.